Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Today I thought I would take a few minutes to talk about our cattle, which are Dexters, and we absolutely love this breed. But first let me tell you how we got into raising them. It was a matter, I guess, of informed happenstance. We, we were starting the farm, it was our first year trying, trying to get the farm up and running, and we visited a friend's house, uh, John and Karen McGillan, and they had a handful of Dexters. And I walked out into their pasture and walked right up to one of them and just loved the cow's attitude. Friendly, uh, manageable size. And so I went home and did some research on the breed and found that they met everything that our farm wanted in a beef cow. Uh, Dexters are a, a small Irish breed. They've been around for a long time. The raising them for beef is suits our market. We're in a market where people don't want to buy a three pound steak. They want a three quarter pound steak, you know, so a small frame breed works out well uh, when you cut it for that. The breed has a great temperament. They're smart. But the really important things to us are they finish really well on grass and the flavor of their beef just can't be beat. We knew that our place in the market was for 100% grass-fed beef, grass-grown, grass-finished. We knew we wanted a cow-calf operation where we raise the mom cows, we have the calves raised right on the farm, we grow out the calves, we send them to market, or in the case of heifer calves, we keep them for breeding. So it seemed like the perfect breed for us. In my opinion, one of the best things about Dexters is their temperament. They're friendly and they're smart. Both of our bulls were raised with a lot of hands-on from um, the breeder. And as soon as we enter the pasture, they come up for a scratch. If they're dangerous at all, it's just because they're playing. You know, they may headbuck a little bit. Prudence, can I get some video of you? Come here, lady. They're just such a great, friendly breed. This is Prudence, and she's one of my favorites. She's smart. She's a good mom. And this is Orden, one of our bulls. See, he's coming for a scratch and to check out the camera. Raising beef cows on a small 45 acres farm such as ours is a difficult business proposition. Cattle take a lot of land and of our 45 acres we only have about 30 that's dedicated to pasture. The rest is forest and, and our actual farm buildings. So 30 acres of arable land. Dexters are really efficient on grass. We have a herd of about 30 right now and um, that 30 on 30 acres gives us plenty of grazing in the summer and allows us to have enough overgrowth or, or overstock of pasture to make hay to feed them through the winter. So our business plan was this, to have 30 head, 10 brood cows or mama cows that get bred every year, 10 yearlings which are cattle that were born last year and were growing out, and then 10 calves every year. With that distribution, we would wind up with 10 beefs to bring to the butcher every year in turn to sell at market. Raising beef is a lot different than other farm enterprises. Now on our farm, we've got chickens and turkeys and pigs as well as the beef cows, and we found that for the chickens, both egg laying and meat chickens, and the turkeys, the payback is very quick. You pretty much get your money back within six months, plus whatever profit you make. Pigs are a little longer, six to seven months to grow out, then you've got to sell them. Beef is the longest. And when we started out, we knew that beef would take probably seven to ten years to recover our initial investment costs, and then start coming back to profit the farm. We had to build fencing, we had to buy haying equipment. We had to build housing. This barn was here, but the barn I'll show you in a little bit, we had to have built. 
because we ran out of hay storage space and space to store uh, haying equipment inside. So it's a long-term investment. But I could never imagine having a farm without beef cows. I grew up on a farm that grew beef cows. We always had cows around here when I was a kid, when I was in high school. So to me, beef is kind of the heart of the farm, even though it's not our, our biggest profit maker right now. So how do we feed our cattle? Well, right now they're eating hay. And we went to making round bales this year because there were just too many square bales for my wife and I to handle as the operation grew. Our decision to go to round bales from square was purely a matter of our energy level. Last year, Hillary and I made 3,500 square bales. I have a kicker on the bale or so. We didn't have to load the wagons, but we had to unload them and stack them by hand. And it was just Hillary and I with a little bit of help from our middle daughter, Grace. And after that was over, we said, we just can't do that. We're not getting any younger. So I bought a round baler this year, and it cut down the work so much. We put a spear on one of the tractor's loader frames so we can lift and maneuver the bales. And now it's just me doing hay. You know, there's no real manual labor required. And that was a big change for us, and we're glad we did it. So here it is at the end of October and they're eating hay because we caught up to pasture growth uh, about three weeks ago. So here's the cycle the way it goes from spring till the end of the year. Around April we turn the cows out onto pasture and the cows will get all of their nutrition from grazing from April through, we like to say, November. Although this year we brought them in a little earlier. Once they're in, they go to a winter pasture, which I'll show you. And that's really just an exercise yard, a fresh air yard. It's not meant for grazing. They come in the barn here to eat hay. And we feed them hay from that October, November period right through to the next April. Now, even though we feed round bales, we feed them inside. Quite often, you'll see round bales being fed outside in these round bale feeders, these metal pipe um, contraptions. I don't like the hay to get rained on. I think it leads to more waste. It also really trashes the field when you're feeding hay in a concentrated place like that. So we feed hay in the barn and for 30 head of Dexter we're talking about one 5x5 five five round bale every other day. So they're eating half of a round bale per day. Pretty efficient breed like I said. Now, when I was a kid growing up on the farm, AI was the way that we bred our cows. In other words, artificial insemination. We had a breeder come, and we looked for the cows to be in heat, and then the breeder would artificially inseminate them. We tried that with our Dexters when we first started out, and we had loads of problems, mostly in detecting the heat. They could go into heat at night. You wouldn't see the standing heat. Sometimes you wouldn't see any signs of heat at all. In fact, we went to such great lengths to detect heats in our cows that we actually put a wireless camera out in the pasture so that we could watch them whenever we were inside. And still we had no luck. We called the inseminator, he would come when we thought they were in heat. You know, they would, you couldn't tell that whether they were bred or not because you didn't see their heats. So we lost at least a year where we'd miss cows' heats and turned out they weren't bred the next spring. So after that, we said, well, geez, you know, this is too stressful. We want to grow our herd, and AI isn't working. We bought a bull. Our first bull was Titus, who is just a magnificent bull. And he does a great job at heat detecting. It's pretty much his only job here. He's always checking all the cows to see if they're coming in heat. We knew that we couldn't sustainably grow our herd with just one bull. So a few years after we bought Titus, we bought Orden who's a Dundexter, and he's kind of our second bull. For us, breeding season is July and August. That way we have calves the following April and May, after mud season is over, when the grass is growing nicely to provide lots of nutrition for the mama cow and her calf. To do that, we have to make sure that the bulls don't breed the cows at the wrong time. The last thing that we want is a calf in February, when it's cold and snowy and windy. 
terrible idea, and, and it, it's happened here before. So we have to keep the bulls separate from the cows in important times of the year. So let me go through that in year's cycle. Starting out in the winter, as they are now, they're all together. The whole herd's one. Bulls, cows, heifers, calves, they're all together. They'll stay this way until the cows go out to graze next April. When the cows and the calves and the yearlings go out to graze, the bulls will stay in the winter pasture and have access to this barn for feeding hay. That way the bulls don't breed the cows too early. So time goes on, the summer develops, and the cows have their calves in the end of April and May out on the pasture. The bulls are in here. The bulls are kept separate from the rest of the herd until late July or early August when we have to do the biggest operation of the whole year, which is dividing the herd for breeding. So we look at our, our pedigrees of our cows and we figure out which bull we want to breed which cow or which heifer. Then we have to bring them all back in to the barn in the winter pasture, keep the bulls separate in another pen while we're doing that, and sort the herd. So some of the, the cows and heifers will stay in here, the barn in the winter pasture, while the rest get split off and sent back out to the summer pastures. Once we've divided the cows and the heifers, then we bring out one bull at a time and put it in with the, with the cows and the heifers that it's assigned to. So at that point we have two herds that are split, which is difficult on a farm like this because they're always within eye shot of each other. And there's nothing more frustrating to a bull than to see a cow or a heifer in heat that he can't get to. So our winter pasture is fortified. It has woven wire cattle fencing around it, four foot high, with a hot wire on top. It's pretty much bullproof. The posts are close, the posts are big. Um, and one bull in his herd stays in here, and the other bull in his herd stays out in the summer pastures. So that division is a complicated thing. They stay this way for at least two heat cycles, which for a cow is 21, 24 days, someplace in that range. And we watched them during that time to mark when each cow is bred. Then the herd can come back together and they stay that way until the cycle repeats itself the following April. Now when we got to a certain size where we said, well, we have enough breeding cows, we don't need to keep all the heifers that were born, and we're going to send them off to the butcher, it added an extra layer of complication. Because now we need to keep those heifers separate from the bulls. The last thing that we want is for a seven month bred heifer to go to the butcher. That's a well-developed calf. So we have to keep the heifers that are going to the butcher separate from the bulls. So now at times we have three different groups that we have to divide our cattle into. And so one's in a pen in the barn, one's in the other pen, one's out in the summer pasture, and the ones that are in the pen here have access to the winter pasture. So you see it gets more complicated the more the herd grows. And every step of the way we've had to build the appropriate inter infrastructure and kind of figure out our way of doing it because if we were a 300 acre farm we would all be set up for that. You know we'd send the bu one bull and one herd over the hill where he couldn't see the rest of the herd and it would be a lot easier. But when you're working on such a tight amount of space, it gets really difficult. I want to talk a little bit about herd dynamics. Every animal on the farm has a pecking order, and cattle are no exception. We see it mostly when we're dividing and recombining the herd, because then the pecking order gets disturbed. Orden is knocking around the camera. So, if, when we separate the bulls, they tend to do a lot of headbutting, and that's how cows and bulls establish dominance. They have pushing matches, and the cow that wins is the one that pushes the other one backwards. And this, between two head of cattle, can go on 
for a day and they're absolutely exhausted at the end of it. But this is how they establish their pecking order. We see it a lot with the bulls. They test each other from time to time because who knows, pecking order could change between the two of them. We see this with our boss cow. Every herd has a boss cow, a boss female. We, uh, we lost our boss cow a couple years ago. She wouldn't breed back, so she went to the butcher and there was a big competition to see who the next cow was. And we thought it was going to be uh, one of our older cows, Sally, who has nice large horns and has seniority in the herd, but she was challenged by Patty right here who's a much younger cow, and you can see kind of has stubby horns. Patty beat out Rose, and Patty is the herd boss now. We see it all the way down the line. When we bring the herd back together, two yearlings that have been separated for just a few months, will see who is the dominant. So there's this head pushing competition up and down the line. Once this pecking order is established, things are relatively smooth because each cow knows where it is in the order and the herd's kind of at peace until the next time they decide to challenge each other. What do we do medically with our Dexters? Immunizations, deworming, dehorning, castration, which do we do? We've never had a parasite problem with our cattle. We send samples to Cornell to have them tested once in a while. Never had, had an issue with that, so we don't deworm them. We don't do immunization. We've never had an issue with disease except for pink eye, especially when the flies are out in the summer. And there's an old saying about pink eye, you can either treat them with an antibiotic and wait three weeks for it to clear up, or you can not treat them with an antibiotic and wait three weeks for it to clear up, and we found that's the case. We do dehorn our Dexters. The traditional lines of Dexters are all horned. And just for safety purposes, we've chose to dehorn them. So every calf that we have here on the farm gets dehorned, usually uh, in the second day before it really gets its feet under it because they're out in the pasture when they're born and we can't catch it. So we do uh, ca both castration and dehorning in the second day of life, they're quick. Uh, we cut for the castration versus using an elastrator or a rubber band system. Um, the calf seems to have forgotten about it by the next day. We dehorn using an electric horn burner, um, but before we do it, we give the calf an analgesic and lidocaine shots so that they don't feel that pain when we burn the horns off, and it's a reliable method. We used to use horn paste, the acid paste but we had mixed results. It was messy. Sometimes it would get on their ear and put a hole in their ear and, you know, and sometimes it didn't work all the way and we'd get these kind of stub horns. So the electric dehorners worked a lot better for us. Do we ever have calving issues? Do we ever have to help the mom calf? Do we ever have to pull calves? The short answer is no. We've never had a calving problem here. Dexters are known for easy calving. Typically, we walk out in the morning and there's the calf and mom together. We seem to have more calves at night than during the day. It's rare for us to actually see one being born, but we've never had an issue. So the only thing we feed our cattle is pasture in the summertime and hay in the wintertime. We do give a mineral supplement, and for that we use a Fertrell, a combination of Fertrell products. Uh, we use a, a product called Grazer's Choice, which is a mineral supplement. Sometimes we feed kelp. Kelp gets kind of pricey. And then we feed uh, loose salt in a, a loose mineral feeder that we keep in the, the, both the winter pasture and in sort of the, near the water tank in the summer pasture. We have been experimenting with using protein lick tubs, which come in 200 pound tubs. They're mainly molasses with a, a trace mineral mix in them. We found when we first tried them out that it improved the cattle's coats, made them shinier, they looked healthier. But the jury's out for us on that. We're, we're going to try them through the winter and, and see what kind of a difference it makes. 
What do we use for fencing? We're minimalists when it comes to fencing. I've seen cattle fenced in six wire, you know, five foot high fences, uh, electrified. We use a two wire fence and we use an expedient fencing system, which is T-posts that we just drive into the ground. Two wires and T-posts with brace corners and ratchets to adjust the fence tension, all electrified by a pretty hot fencing unit. That's the summer pasture. In the summertime, they're moving all the time to fresh grass and they don't really put a lot of pressure on the fence. So two wires works fine. Now in the winter pasture, when we have a lot of young calves coming in and we want to really keep them in this pasture, we've gone to using a woven wire fence that's four foot high with uh, large wooden posts closely spaced and a hot wire on the top. This is a good mom. Look, she's got two calves sucking off her at the same time. And our attitude on weaning is this. We don't wean calves. We let their mom wean them for them. The cow will let her calf nurse for 10 to 11 months. And as her due date approaches for her next calf, she'll wean the previous year's calf herself. And I think that's a lot better than pulling the calves away from the moms after four months, as a lot of farms do. I sure do enjoy spending time with the cows almost as much as I enjoy eating beef. And let me show you the beef that the, these cattle produce. Like I said, we're finishing on grass, but we're getting that nice marbling in the meat. This is a T-bone steak. It is a hallmark of grain finished beef. That's what keeps the, the beef moist when you cook it. It's tender. It doesn't have those qualities that grass-fed beef is sometimes knocked for. It's not tough. It's not gamey. It stays juicy because it's marbled well. So this is a T-bone steak. Rib steaks. I love rib steaks. Same quality. You have this dark colored meat. A lot of small marbling inside the meat. Good fat on the outside. These are delicious. I'd take grass-fed beef over grain-fed any day. It's just the flavor is so much more intense, particularly from the Dexter breed. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with me and our Dexters today. They're such a great breed, and as you can tell, I love to talk about them. I'll see you soon.